This video provides an overview of the major concepts covered in Chapter 6, Money Markets. Money markets facilitate the transfer of short-term funds from individuals, corporations, or governments with excess funds to those with deficient funds. And money markets enable financial market participants to maintain liquidity. Chapter 6 includes three key learning objectives. First, to describe the features of the most popular money market securities. Second, to explain how money markets are used by institutional investors. And third, to explain how money markets have become globally integrated. Let's start by looking at money market securities. Money market securities are debt instruments with a maturity of one year or less and are issued in the primary market by the treasury, corporations, and financial intermediaries that wish to obtain short-term financing. The means by which money markets facilitate the flow of funds are illustrated in this exhibit, where we can see that the government uses funds from the sale of treasury bills to fund government spending programs. Corporations sell money market securities to fund existing business operations or expansion. And financial intermediaries use money raised from issuing money market securities to loan funds to corporations and to households who spend money on cars, homes, credit cards, etc. When the U.S. government needs to borrow funds, the U.S. Treasury frequently issues short-term securities known as Treasury Bills or T-Bills. Depository institutions commonly invest in T-Bills so that they can retain a portion of their funds and assets, which can be easily liquidated if they suddenly need to accommodate deposit withdrawals. Other financial institutions invest in T-Bills in case they need cash because their cash outflows exceed their inflows. Individuals with substantial savings invest in T-bills for liquidity purposes. And corporations invest in T-bills so they have easy access to funding if they suddenly incur unanticipated expenses. Treasury bills are attractive to investors because they're backed by the federal government and therefore are virtually free of credit or default risk. Another attractive feature of T-bills is their liquidity, which is due to their short-term maturity and strong secondary market. The par value, which is the amount received by investors at maturity of T-bills, is $1,000 and multiples of $1,000. Because T-bills do not pay interest, they're sold at a discount from par value, and the gain to the investor holding a T-bill until maturity is the difference between the par value and the price paid. The price that an investor will pay for a T-bill with a particular maturity depends on the investor's required rate of return on that T-bill. The value of a T-bill is the present value of the par value. Thus, investors are willing to pay a price for a one-year T-bill that ensures the amount they receive a year later will generate their desired return. For example, if investors require a 4% annualized return on a one-year T-bill with a $10,000 par value, the price they're willing to pay is $9,615.38, calculated as the $10,000 par value divided by 1 plus the 4% required rate of return. If the investors require a higher rate of return, they'll discount the $10,000 at a higher rate of return, which will result in a lower price that they're willing to pay today. To price a T-bill with a maturity shorter than one year, the annualized return can be reduced by a fraction of the year in which the funds will be invested. So if an investor requires a 4% annualized return on a six-month T-bill, this reflects a 2% annualized return over six months. The price they're willing to pay for a T-bill with a par value of $10,000 then is $9,803.92. Because T-bills don't offer coupon payments and are sold at a discount from their par value, their yield is influenced by the difference between the selling price and the purchase price. If an investor purchases a newly issued T-bill and holds it until maturity, the return is based on the difference between the par value and the purchase price. If the T-bill is sold prior to maturity, the return is based on the difference between the price for which the bill was sold in the secondary market and the purchase price. The annualized yield from investing in a T-bill, or YT, can be determined as the difference between the selling price, SP, and the purchase price, PP, divided by the purchase price, multiplied by 365, divided by the number of days of the investment, or the holding period, N. For example, an investor purchases a T-bill with a 6-month, 182-day maturity, and a $10,000 par value for $9,800. If this T-bill is held until maturity, its yield is 4.09%. Now suppose the investor plans to sell the T-bill after 120 days and forecasts a selling price of $9,950 at that time. The expected annualized yield based on this forecast is 4.65%, calculated using the expected selling price of $9,950 instead of the par value. Overall, 
The higher the forecasted price, the higher the expected annualized yield. Some business periodicals quote the T-bill discount along with the T-bill. The T-bill discount represents the percentage discount of the purchase price from the par value for newly issued T-bills and is calculated as the par value, par, less the purchase price, PP, divided by the par value, multiplied by 360 days over the holding period N. Note that the discount formula uses a 360-day year versus the 365-day year used in the yield calculation. If we apply this formula to an example where if a newly issued 6-month, 182-day T-bill with a par value of $10,000 is purchased for $9,800, the T-bill discount is calculated to be 3.95%. The primary T-bill market is an auction where investors have the option of bidding competitively or non-competitively. Non-competitive bidders are limited to purchasing T-bills with a maximum par value of $10 million per auction. Competitive bidders specify the price that they're willing to pay along with the quantity desired. Commercial paper is a short-term debt instrument used only by well-known creditworthy firms and is typically unsecured. Most commonly, these securities are issued to provide liquidity or to finance a firm's investment in inventory and accounts receivable and are often an alternative to short-term bank loans. Although commercial paper is issued by creditworthy firms, all corporations are susceptible to business failure, so commercial paper is subject to credit risk. Some investors rely heavily on credit ratings to assess credit risk of commercial paper by rating agencies such as Moody's, Standard & Poor's & Fitch. Those ratings serve as an indicator of the potential risk of default. Some commercial paper is backed by the assets of the issuer. However, the issuers of asset-backed commercial paper tend to have more risk of default than well-known firms that can successfully issue unsecured commercial paper, and the value of the assets used as collateral may be questioned. Therefore, the yields offered on asset-backed commercial paper are often higher than yields offered on unsecured commercial paper. Like T-bills, commercial paper does not pay interest and is priced at a discount from par value. At any given point in time, the yield on commercial paper is slightly higher than on a T-bill with the same maturity because commercial paper carries some credit risk and is less liquid. The nominal return to investors who retain the paper until maturity is the difference between the price paid for the paper and the par value. Thus, the yield received by a commercial paper investor can be determined in a similar manner to the T-bill yield, although a 360-day year is normally used. For example, if an investor purchases 30-day commercial paper with a par value of a million dollars for a price of $996,000 and holds the commercial paper until maturity, the annualized yield, or YCP, is 4.82%. The commercial paper yield curve represents the yield offered on commercial paper at various maturities based on the assumption that the paper is held to maturity. The same factors that affect the treasury yield curve affect the commercial paper yield curve, but they're applied to very short time horizons. The rate or yield offered on newly issued commercial paper over time is provided in this exhibit. The perceived credit risk of commercial paper played an important role in the credit crisis in 2008. Lehman Brothers, a large securities firm, relied on commercial paper as a permanent source of financing. As its outstanding issues of commercial paper came due, it would issue more paper and use the proceeds to pay off the paper that had reached maturity. Lehman was also heavily invested in mortgage-backed securities which served as collateral when issuing commercial paper to borrow funds. However, when the housing market crashed and the value of mortgage-backed securities declined in 2008, institutional investors were no longer willing to purchase Lehman's commercial paper because they questioned the value of the collateral. Because Lehman could not obtain new funding, it was unable to pay off its debt and filed for bankruptcy in September 2008, where it defaulted on hundreds of millions of dollars of commercial paper. This exhibit shows that the commercial paper market had not completely recovered since the credit crisis. The amount of commercial paper outstanding reached a high of about $2.2 trillion in 2007, but is less than $1.2 trillion in 2023. Negotiable Certificates of Deposit, or NCDs, are certificates issued by large commercial banks and other depository institutions as a short-term source of funds. Some issuers place their NCDs directly Others use a third-party institution that specializes in placing NCDs. Another alternative is to sell NCDs to securities dealers, which in turn resell them. NCDs provide a return in the form of interest along with the difference between the price at which the NCD is redeemed or sold in the secondary market and the purchase price. 
Given that an institution issues an NCD at par value, the annualized return that it will pay is the annualized interest on the NCD. If investors purchase the NCD and hold it until maturity, their annualized yield is the interest rate. However, the annualized yield can differ from the annualized interest rate for investors who either purchase or sell the NCD in the secondary market instead of holding it from inception to maturity. For example, say an investor purchased an NCD a year ago in the secondary market for $990,000. The investor redeems it today upon maturity and receives a million dollars. The investor also receives interest of $40,000. The annualized yield, Y NCD, on this investment is 5.05%, calculated as the million dollar par value received at maturity, less the $990,000 purchase price, plus the $40,000 in interest, all divided by the $990,000 purchase price. With a repurchase agreement or repo, one party sells securities to another with an agreement to repurchase the securities at a specified date and price. In essence, the repo transaction represents a loan backed by the securities. If the borrower defaults on the loan, the lender has claim to the securities. A reverse repo refers to the purchase of securities by one party from another with an agreement to sell them. During the credit crisis of 2008, as the value of mortgage securities declined, financial institutions participating in the housing market became exposed to more risk. As a result, many financial institutions that relied on the repo market for funding were not able to obtain funds. Investors grew more concerned about the securities that were posted as collateral, causing financing for financial institutions such as Bear Stearns to dry up. The repo rate is determined as the difference between the initial selling price of the securities and the agreed-upon purchase price annualized to a 360-day year. For example, consider an investor who initially purchased securities at a price of $9,920,000 while agreeing to sell them back at a price of $10 million at the end of the 90-day period. The yield or repo rate on this repurchase agreement is 3.23%. Federal funds markets enables depository institutions to lend or borrow short-term funds from each other at the federal funds rate, which is the rate charged on federal funds transactions. Commercial banks are the most active participants in the federal funds market. Federal funds brokers serve as intermediaries in the market, matching up financial institutions that wish to sell or lend funds with those that wish to purchase or borrow. A banker's acceptance indicates a bank accepts responsibility for a future payment. Bankers' acceptances are commonly used for international trade transactions. Exporters can hold a banker's acceptance until the date at which payment is to be made, but they frequently sell the acceptance before then at a discount to obtain cash immediately. This is normally accomplished through a secondary market. The investor's return on a banker's acceptance, like that on commercial paper, is derived from the difference between the discounted price for the acceptance and the amount to be received in the future. The sequence of steps involved in a banker's acceptance is illustrated in this exhibit, which is based on a U.S. importer wishing to purchase goods from a Japanese exporter. This exhibit summarizes the various types of money market securities. When such securities are issued to obtain funds, the type of securities issued depends on whether the issuer is a treasury, a depository institution, or a corporation. The prices of money market securities change in response to a change in the required rate of return, which itself is influenced by the risk-free interest rate and the perceived credit risk over time. This exhibit identifies the underlying forces that can affect the short-term risk-free interest rate, the T-bill rate, and the risk premium, and therefore influence the required return and ultimately the prices of money market securities over time. Now let's move on to institutional use of money markets which can be summarized in this exhibit. Financial institutions purchase money market securities in order to earn a return while maintaining adequate liquidity. Some financial institutions issue their own money market instruments to obtain cash. For example, depository institutions issue NCDs and bank holding companies and finance companies issue commercial paper. Depository institutions also obtain funds through the use of repurchase agreements or in the federal funds market. The last key concept in the chapter is the globalization of money markets. As international trade and financing have grown, money markets have developed in Europe, Asia, and South America. International banks facilitate the international money markets by accepting deposits and providing loans in a wide variety of currencies. The rate charged for a loan from one bank to another in the international interbank market is the London Interbank Offer Rate, or LIBOR, which is similar to the federal funds rate in the United States. 
In 2012, some banks that periodically report the interest rate they offer in the interbank market falsely reported their rates. These banks had some investments or loan positions whose performance depended on the prevailing LIBOR rate, and some banks were charged with colluding to manipulate LIBOR in an attempt to boost their trading profits. As corporations outside the United States have increasingly engaged in international trade transactions in U.S. dollars, U.S. dollar deposits in non-U.S. banks have grown. These dollar deposits in Europe are referred to as euro dollars. Several types of money market securities utilize euro dollars. Euro dollar certificates of deposit are large dollar denominated deposits accepted by banks in Europe. Euro notes are short term securities issued in bearer form with common maturities of one, three, and six months. Euro commercial paper or Euro CP is issued without the backing of a banking syndicate and maturities can be tailored to satisfy investors. The performance of an investment in a foreign money market security is measured by the effective yield, that is, the yield adjusted for the exchange rate, which is a function of two factors, the yield earned on the money market security in the foreign currency and the exchange rate effect. The yield earned on the foreign money market security, YF, is the difference between the selling price and the purchase price divided by the purchase price. This yield, YF, is then used in the determination of the effective yield, YE, which is calculated as 1 plus the foreign yield, multiplied by 1 plus the exchange rate effect, denoted as the price change in S, and then subtracting 1. For example, assume a U.S. investor obtains Mexican pesos when the peso is worth 12 cents, and invests in a one-year money market security that provides a yield in pesos of 9%. At the end of one year, the investor converts the proceeds from the investment back to dollars at the prevailing spot rate at 12.96 cents per peso. In this example, the peso increased in value by 8%. The effective yield earned by the investor then is 17.72%, calculated as 1 plus the 9% foreign yield times 1 plus the 8% increase in the peso, and then subtracting 1. However, such an investment is subject to the risk that the currency will depreciate over time. So if the peso had decreased by 8% in our previous example, the effective yield on the investment would have been 0.28%.